Florida's general election is just about a month away. And some of the candidates are with us tonight to answer questions about important issues. Rally 2014 starts now. This original program is provided as a public service by WSRE, the League of Women Voters, and Pensacola State College. Good evening and welcome to Rally 2014. I'm Drexel Gilbert with WSRE-TV. And I'm Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. This is the first of two nights we will be with you for Rally 2014 election coverage on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. That's right. Now tonight and then again Wednesday night, you will be meeting candidates from races in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties, as well as candidates for Florida House Districts 1 and 2 and the 1st U.S. Congressional District. And the spotlight tonight is on that congressional race, as well as Florida House Districts 1 and 2, the contest for Okaloosa County School Board District 3, and the race for Pensacola Mayor. Then on Wednesday night, the candidates for Escambia County Commission Districts 2 and 4 will be in our studios to answer questions, along with candidates for Escambia County School Board District 3. From Santa Rosa County, we will hear from candidates for Santa Rosa County Commission Districts 2 and 4 and School Board District 3. The questions that will be put before the candidates have been provided to us by committees of the Pensacola Bay Area League of Women Voters and the Okaloosa County League of Women Voters. The candidates have not seen the questions. In each race, the candidates will each be asked the same questions and they will have 45 seconds to respond. At the conclusion of the question and answer session, each candidate will then have 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement. We are going to begin tonight with the race for U.S. Congress, District 1. This congressional district includes Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton counties, and a portion of Holmes County. There are three candidates on the ballot in November. Our candidates are seated in and will be introduced in alphabetical order. The first candidate we will introduce in this race tonight is Jim Bryan. Mr. Bryan is running as a Democrat. He resides in Laurel Hill. Seated next to him is Jeff Miller. Mr. Miller is the Republican incumbent in this contest. He has served in Congress since 2001 and he resides in Chamakla. And seated next to him is Mark Wishern, who lives in Miramar Beach. Mr. Wishern is running with no party affiliation. Gentlemen, welcome. Sandra and I will alternate asking questions in this race, and we begin alphabetically, so we will start the round of questions with Mr. Bryan. Mr. Bryan, the extremist group ISIS, or ISIL, uh, continues to dominate world and domestic headlines. What are your views on the use of United States air power to strike ISIS targets in Syria and Iraq? I feel it's vital that we take immediate action, especially air action. Uh, but, you know, keep in mind, this situation wouldn't even have arisen if it hadn't have been uh, steps taken in the war in Iraq uh, to, to put in place a democracy. You know, they, they did it. you got to look at history. What happened in Japan in the Second World War? What happened in Germany in the Second World War? Uh, that didn't take place. So, therefore, we're suffering a lot of the consequences from an ill-prepared uh, standing there from the start. All right, thank you, sir. And now we go to um, Mr. Miller, and we ask you the same question. Sir, what are your views on the use of United States air power to strike ISIS targets in Syria and Iraq in light of uh, this continuing domination in the headlines of this group in uh, ISIS? I support the use of air power in both Iraq and in Syria. Unfortunately, it is too little too late. Uh, the president has already said what he will not do, and that is put boots on the ground, and I think that that was a tactical error uh, to expose to the enemy what the United States would not do. Uh, there are going to have to be ground forces there, forward air controllers and spotters that are going to be working with 
uh, both the rebels in Syria and, of course, the Kurds in Iraq. The problem began when President Obama did not get a status of forces agreement that was necessary for forces to remain in Iraq, and I think that is why ISIL or ISIS uh, has grown. All right, thank you. And now the question goes to you, Mr. Wishern. Your opinion your, uh, on, on the use of U.S. air power to strike ISIS targets. Well, actually, I think we need to look at something else other than attacking another nation again. Uh, what about our borders? They're completely wide open. This should be our number one concern. Because if it's not our concern, we've got our back door wide open. We don't know what's coming across that border, whether it be diseases, uh, whether it be dirty bombs, it's wide open. Nobody's done anything about it. So I think the focus ought to be putting on our borders first and protecting our backyard before we start bombing other nations. Uh, secondly, you know, whatever happened to the Constitution where we actually declared war before we went in. So I think, again, we need to take care of our own borders first before we start looking at uh, bombing other nations. All right, thank you. Our next question will go first to Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, how should Congress protect the nation's infrastructure from cyber terrorism, specifically the electric grid, public water supply, and public transportation? I think that the cyber area is going to be the next battlefield. Of course, we know that the Chinese and the Russians are both trying to hack into both government systems and private systems on a daily basis. The most important thing for us is to protect the infrastructure that exists out there. I think most Americans are unaware uh, of how reliant we are uh, on the computer systems, both for our power, our water, uh, and other infrastructure that exists out there. That's why there is a cyber command uh, with a four star uh, that is in charge of that because it is a battlefield, a battlefield that doesn't exist on land, it exists in the ether. All right, the question goes next to Mr. Wishern. How do you think uh, Congress should protect the nation's infrastructure from cyber terrorism? Well, I think we need to look at actually uh, allowing our people to come off the grid and be able to have some separate support other than what's depended upon Congress. I think we're overstepping our boundaries a lot and uh, we need to look back into the constitutional rights of what Congress can actually do. So uh, for instance, the state of Florida, it's illegal to be off the grid. Um, I think that's ridiculous and that's done basically because you have uh, the powers that be that want to go ahead and uh, they want to go ahead and go the corporate route. In other words, we can't actually be off the grid because it affects the corporate power uh, things we have. So I think we need to focus on uh, local control of our power grid. All right, thank you. And now this uh, second question goes next to Mr. Bryan. And the question is, how should Congress protect the nation's infrastructure from cyber terrorism? I think the, the most important thing is leadership in Congress. You know, when you when you look at our lines of defense, it's not only the president, it's also the two houses of Congress. The two houses of Congress must show more leadership, which they haven't done in the past. And it's going to take funds. Uh, these funds need to be in place and good organizational skills. Yeah, you do have a four-star, but we need a lot more than that. Uh, these attacks are happening daily as we speak. Uh, we've had hackers attack our financial institutions. Uh, they've stolen all kind of personal information, and we need the funds to take care of that. Thank you. All right, and we can remind our candidates, too, as we ask the questions, they have 45 seconds to respond. At 40 seconds, you get you hear one ding of the bell, and that's your five-second warning, and then uh, once you reach 45 seconds, it will ding again. So now we're on to question number three, and we begin now with Mr. Wishern. And this question, sir, it says, uh, what role should the United States play, if any, in Afghanistan once the troop withdrawal is complete there? Well, I think this whole invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq is more of a financial issue with the Federal Reserve. But uh, realistically, we need to not be there. We should have not been there in the first place. Again, we need to go back to the Constitution, and a war should have been declared by Congress before we stepped into that. Um, so backtracking now, um, you know, we should have our men out of there. It's already a mess going over there with ISIS now or ISIL or al-Qaeda, whatever you want to call it this year, uh, is just another, just another problem. All we're going to do is cause more problems with them, 
and uh, continue the same issues. So we don't learn from history. All we continually do is the same thing over and over again, and we're burying this country in debt. All right, thank you. And the question now goes to you, Mr. Bryan. What role do you believe the United States should play once the troop withdrawal is complete in Afghanistan? I still think it's a very important role for leadership. Uh, America is the leader in the world. It needs to maintain and keep a leadership role uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm a retired military, and I believe in training. You know, when you're in a country like that that still uh, has the residual problems trying to develop a, a democracy, uh, democracy has not been developed in Afghanistan. And we need to keep on pursuing that goal. Uh, but yes, pull the troops out, but let's, we have to have leadership there uh, to help them develop a democracy. All right, thank you. And now the question to you, Mr. Miller, your position on what the United States' role should be once the troop withdrawal is complete in Afghanistan. First of all, I think the troop withdrawal issue is purely political. President Obama said that he was going to do that. Uh, he announced to our enemies when we were going to leave. And I believe that not leaving troops in place like we have in other parts of the world is going to bring instability. We have the same thing happening uh, in Iraq today where there was a vacuum that now has been taken up uh, by uh, ISIL. I don't believe the American people have forgotten what happened on September 11th. We went there for a reason and that's because we allowed and the world allowed a safe haven for the Taliban to be able to put together one of the most heinous attacks on this country in our history. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We are now up to question number four, and we will direct this question to Mr. Bryan first. The question is, strict voter identification rules in several states have kept qualified citizens from the polls because required documents are not available. What are your views on having Congress investigate whether such rules unfairly deny voting rights? Well, you know, there was an 85-year-old lady that went into, I think it was South Carolina, and she's not allowed to vote, uh, you know, a driver's license, she doesn't have a driver's license. You know, the most important and sacred thing in America is the right to vote. And everyone should have that opportunity. You know, they investigated uh, voter fraud. They didn't find voter fraud. And when a political party deliberately goes to stop or prevent people from voting, that's totally unacceptable. And it's unpatriotic. That's what we fought in these wars for, is these rights, and the right to vote's one of them. All right, thank you. Mr. Miller, this question next to you. What are your views on having Congress investigate whether these strict voter ID rules uh, unfairly deny voting rights? First of all, I support the use of photo IDs for people when they go to the polls. Now, if there is some type of abuse, I think that somebody, probably the Department of Justice, needs to be involved in investigating that. Unfortunately, the Obama administration chooses not to do that. We've seen it with the new Black Panthers in the past, where they actually have kept people from coming to the polls to vote. Nobody is disenfranchised because they don't have voter ID. They're allowed to cast a provisional ballot. Then that ballot is verified the day after the election or several days afterwards. And I think that it's a red herring to say that it is, in fact, suppressing voters because you have to have an ID to vote. All right, thank you. And now, Mr. Wisher, in this question to you, I'll read it from the top. Strict voter identification rules in several states have kept previously qualified citizens from the polls because required documents are unavailable. What are your views on having Congress investigate whether such rules unfairly deny voting rights? Well, I absolutely believe that uh, we have to have some type of ID before we vote, so we actually know that that person isn't even alive for that matter. I think we also need to look at the fact that some of the ID rules, uh, such as the Real ID Act here in Florida, needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. I mean, using biometrics to view people and uh, be able to pick them up on cameras throughout the United States is a complete invasion of our privacy. So I think there's a, that's a twofold question. Yeah, we absolutely need ID, but we need to look at the ID we're actually using with the Real ID Act. 
All right, thank you, gentlemen. And now it's time for question five, and this question goes first to you, Mr. Miller. What legislation would you support concerning the best way to deal with the millions of undocumented aliens who are in the United States? And you have 45 seconds, sir. You know, the interesting thing is we should follow the law as it's already written. And again, the Obama administration and the Department of Justice have chosen not to do that. We need to secure the borders. Secure the borders either with real fences or some type of electronic fencing system that's down there. I have advocated for a long time allowing the National Guard to go down there and guard those borders. We've seen a propensity by this administration to allow tens of thousands of individuals and the most recent obviously is the flooding of the, the children from three particular countries uh, in South America. But there are laws on the books and we need to follow those laws as they are written. And this administration is choosing not to do that. All right, thank you. Now to you, Mr. Wishern. What legislation would you support on dealing with the millions of undocumented aliens in the United States? Well, first of all, I think maybe we should not let ICE ship them throughout the United States because that's exactly what's going on. Not only are they coming across the border, but we're moving them to every part of the country to spread them thin and get them covering every part of this United States. And I see that as a bigger issue. Um, looking in, then, of course, um, we do need to secure the borders. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we can't allow these guys to continue to come in. Um, it's ridiculous that uh, the Obama administration, Congress in general, allows this to happen. This is a national defense issue, and this needs to be addressed as national defense. All right, thank you. And now the question to you, Mr. Bryan. What legislation would you support concerning the way to deal with the millions of undocumented aliens in the United States? And we're, we're talking about millions. We're talking about, I think, the current figures anywhere from 11 million to 14 million. What do we do with them? First of all, we have a immigration policy that needs to be in place. And that's what Congress has to do. Both houses of Congress, and not only both parties, need to come together to, to hammer out legislation uh, on the immigration issue. And I believe at one time we had some bills coming forward, but they didn't go up for a vote. Uh, this is a major issue. And when it affects 11 to 14 million people, it definitely affects the United States. All right, thank you. And we have now reached the midway point in our questions for these candidates for U.S. Congress District 1. We will take a short break and we'll be right back. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on Election Day. Good evening. I am Ed Meadows, President of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning in to Rally 2014, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV, and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Okaloosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on Election Day. To vote by mail, contact the Okaloosa County Supervisor of Elections Office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or visit the Supervisor's Office locations in Crestview and Fort Walton Beach. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. Early voting takes place from Monday, October 20th through Saturday, November 1st at the five locations listed on your screen. Hours for early voting are 9 a.m. until 7 p.m. each day. On the day of the general election, Tuesday, November 4th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to take a photo and signature ID with you.
welcome back. Time now to resume posing questions to the candidates for U.S. Congress District 1. We began the last round with Mr. Miller, and so question six goes first to Mr. Wishon. And the question is, how do you suggest the U.S. and NATO deal with Russian President Putin's actions in Ukraine? Well, the actions that uh, Ukraine has done is, is really controversial. Uh, we've seen an airline get shot down, uh, AK-47 is restricted coming back in the United States, which I don't understand how that has an involvement in it, but uh, nevertheless, that's one of the organizations that Obama went after. Um, other issues with that is we need to look at the fact that what has actually prompted all this. And uh, this is a lot of military involvement in the United States in this battle going back and forth between who's the bigger man on the block. And uh, Putin is just, uh, he's, he's a man, that, he's very serious. It's somebody we need to look at very cautiously and address him very rapidly because he is, I'm uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. All right, thank you. We will go next to Mr. Bryan. How do you suggest the U.S. and NATO deal with President Putin's actions in Ukraine? Well, I worked pretty closely with NATO when I was in Europe. Uh, I was in Italy three and a half years and I went to a, a lot of different NATO exercises. You know, the key is strength in NATO. Uh, we have to have a very strong alliance in our NATO uh, countries. And also, let's, let's bring uh, the bear, bring to bear sanctions. Uh, you sanction Russia strong enough, and uh, I guarantee you they'll change their actions. In fact, they already are. Uh, in the news yesterday, they were already starting to make some concessions in this situation. And uh, I think with the sanctions in place and stronger sanctions, I uh, definitely think we can make a difference. All right, thank you. And uh, you now, Mr. Miller, get this question. How do you suggest the U.S. and NATO deal with President Putin's actions in Ukraine? The United States and all of our NATO allies need to take what uh, Russia is doing right now very seriously. We allowed Russia to go into Georgia, uh, claim areas there. The same thing now, because we did nothing then, uh, is happening in the Ukraine. Part of the problem with the EU and what is going on in that part of Europe is so much of their energy is dependent upon Russia. Uh, we need to help those countries, uh, many of our allies, uh, become less dependent on that, even if we supply to them uh, natural gas, liquefied natural gas, and other types of heating uh, and energy uh, products. All right, thank you. It's time now to start with question seven with Mr. Bryan. And this question, where do you stand on the debate on the Keystone Pipeline that is designed to move oil from the Canadian oil sands to the Gulf Coast? And you have 45 seconds, sir. Well, I do believe in energy production. However, uh, I don't have enough facts to really make a good uh, determination on that. Uh, you know, our push now for independence in our energy program, it's not only with the Keystone. Uh, keep in mind, there's things that I don't know about it yet. However, we need to be uh, focusing on solar and wind, in which right now we're making some very good gains uh, throughout this country in the production of wind and solar. So the Keystone, I think, is important, but I don't have enough facts yet to, to make a determination. All right, thank you, sir. And now to you, Mr. Miller. What is your position on the debate in the Keystone Pipeline to move, um, oil from the Canadian, uh, move oil from the Canadian oil sands to the Gulf Coast? We need to build the Keystone Pipeline right now. Uh, we should have built this pipeline years ago. Unfortunately, the Obama administration has been blocking the construction of this particular pipeline. When you talk about shovel-ready projects, this is one of them. And there has been so much time spent, again, because of political issues, to block this very important pipeline that would provide tens of thousands of jobs and then, of course, give the southern part of the United States the ability to be able to process uh, this oil that comes from uh, the tar sands. But again, stop blocking it, Mr. President. Allow the pipeline to be built today. 
today. All right, we do have um, a rebuttal, but we're going to let um, Mr. Wishern answer the question, and then we'll get to your rebuttal, Mr. Um, Mr. Bryan. And Mr. Wishern, your position on the Keystone Pipeline debate. Well, the Keystone Pipeline should have been built a long time ago. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We wouldn't be so dependent on foreign oil and be involved in so many of these wars over this petrodollar issue. Um, we also need to look into more renewable energy, such as uh, you know, geothermal, as well as wind and solar, to give us another alternative, because we need to wean ourselves away from uh, fossil fuels, period. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Ryan did raise his hand uh, for a rebuttal, and sir, you have 30 seconds to deliver that. You know, part of the reason I haven't made my mind up yet is, you know, the governors of these states have not accepted that. Now, everybody says, oh, it's Mr. Obama. What about our governors? You know, the governors do have a say-so when it comes across their states, and those governors have not approved that. Now, if we get all the governors to accept that through all those states that the pipeline's coming through, then maybe I could agree to that. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We'll move on to our next question. Uh, and this will go first to Mr. Miller. The EPA has published proposed rules to reduce carbon emissions from power plants by 30 percent within 15 years, with each state, uh, state rather having flexibility in how to achieve the goal. What is your opinion of the proposed requirement? First of all, I'm glad to hear that states are given flexibility. Uh, part of the problem that exists today is the onerous regulations that the federal government places not only on state but local governments and private individuals as well. Uh, obviously, uh, trying to protect the environment is important to all of us, but I think there is an overreach at the EPA uh, these days, in particular not giving credit to what many of the power plants have already spent. Right here in Pensacola, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, have been spent by Gulf Power trying to achieve the necessary things that have been required of them, and they've gotten no credit for it. And along comes the Obama administration and gives another regulation. All right, thank you. We'll move next to Mr. Uh, Wishern. The EPA, again, has published proposed rules to reduce carbon emissions by 30 percent within the next 15 years, giving states some flexibility in how to get there. What is your opinion of this proposed requirement? Well, for years, the EPA has been doing an end around the states. They're going directly and they're going directly to the county commissioners nationwide and stealing property, stealing waterways, using the Greenlands or the Greenways Act, the Blue Ways Act, uh, as well as endangered species. So we need to stop this. And what we really need to do is enforce or allow our states to have their rights back again. And uh, it's going to all boil down to constitutional sheriffs fighting this and making sure that we can keep the EPA out of our property. Again, the Federal Reserve, or I'm sorry, the federal uh, government is not allowed to own land outside of the federal enclaves and also the District of Columbia. So we need to fight this on jurisdiction and kick them off our properties. All right, thank you. And now to you, Mr. Bryan. What is your opinion of this proposed rule to reduce carbon emissions by 30 percent within 15 years? Actually, I agree with it. I think it should, we should do more, not less. Uh, we need clean water. We need clean air. Uh, we need a healthy sense of living. And uh, right now we don't have that. You know, I've been all over the world probably three or four times around the globe. And I've seen other countries and I've seen filth. I've seen dirty water. I've seen the living conditions where they have no EPA. So let's get real here. Let's think about the consequences of what happens to our globe in a global economy what's going to happen in 50 years from now. Right now, we're starting to reach a tipping point, and we need to really consider that. Well, thank you. All right, thank you. We have a couple of more questions to pose to these candidates, and continuing along now with the environmental um, subject matter that we've been discussing, what role do you believe, Mr. Wishern, starting with you first, should the government play in encouraging and supporting research and development of renewable energy in our nation? Well, I absolutely believe we need to go look at, into renewable energy. There's a lot of patents that are already out there that can be established, um, but it seems like they're being covered up and, and uh, bought out, I should say, on a lot of the patents. So we need to look into it a lot further and get away from, uh, again, all the fossil fuels. Looking into the EPA, again, um, keep and limit their, their jurisdiction on where they, what they need to be actually doing. 
So uh, we need to look a lot into the research and the development of uh, renewable energy. All right, thank you. The question now to you, Mr. Bryan. What do you believe the government should do to encourage and support research and development of renewable energy in our country? We need uh, more funding, and a good example, geothermal is one that hadn't been uh, funded near enough, as well as uh, wind and solar. But keep in mind, right here in Pensacola, the GE plant, when you see these big white containers come in from a little town called Op, Alabama, in Op, they build these containers that house the generator for windmills, and they go out west, they go into the Midwest, and uh, there are thousands of them going into place now. And right here in Pensacola is, is one example of, of how important it is for our manufacturing for these. All right, thank you. And Mr. Miller, what do you believe the government should do to encourage and support the research and development of renewable energy in America? Of course we need to look at ways to get off of fossil fuels. One of the things that nobody's talked about tonight is the use of nuclear uh, power. It's one of the cleanest abilities to provide power. Countries like France have 70 percent of their energy generated through nuclear uh, energy. Uh, I think that what we're seeing though is this government, the federal government, trying to force the market and instead of letting the market take care of itself, things like using algae for fuel in jets and you have the Green Hornet flying around at $250 a gallon for fuel, you just can't afford to do that and you need to let the market figure it out. All right, thank you. We're moving on now to our final question for these candidates for U.S. Congress District 1, and it'll go first to Mr. Bryan. What actions should the federal government take to address the issue or the shortage of medical doctors, particularly general practitioners and those who work in rural areas of the country? You know, we have a great need in this country for health care workers, and we have a big shortage. One reason, the population's getting older. Our Vietnam veterans is a good example. Uh, the VA right now, by the way, is short 26,000 in the healthcare profession. Uh, and we hadn't addressed that issue. Uh, we hadn't addressed the issue of a population that's getting, that gets older and has more health issues and requires more health care. And uh, until we address these issues, and start to train these doctors. You know, we do have doctors coming from other countries as well, training here, and uh, we need to support that more. All right, thank you. Now to you, Mr. Miller, what actions should the federal government take to address the shortage of medical doctors? Well, interestingly enough, in the state of Florida, we're gonna have a shortage of about 26,000 uh, physicians here, and part of the problem is the residency slots uh, that Years ago, the formula was established when New York was a much larger state than us. They're going to have more residents than we will in the state of Florida, even though we have the need that's down here. And so one of the things that we did uh, in the Access and Accountability Act as it relates to the Department of Veterans Affairs was we provided an additional 1,500 uh, GME or graduate medical exam slots to provide more doctors the ability to work at VA and of course in Florida we need to do the same thing. All right, thank you Mr. Miller and now finally this uh, last question to you Mr. Wishern. What actions do you think the federal government should take to address the shortage of medical doctors? Well I think it also leads into Obamacare. I think we need to eliminate Obamacare because I think that's playing a major role in uh, what is actually going on with the medical uh, also looking at the Ro um, Rockefeller's control over the medical industry because they basically own through their foundations all of the medical schools in the United States. And uh, one thing I'd like to address is the, uh, I'd propose that we take the VA hospitals and move them to the private sector. I'd like to see our veterans actually get a medical card similar to what Congress has so we can actually get them the proper care we need. But really we need to expand the entire medical industry and uh, really push forward on the schooling system. All right, thank you, and we have a request for a rebuttal from Mr. Miller, 30 seconds. All I want to say is don't give the veterans what members of Congress have as far as health insurance. I'm on Obamacare. I actually am on the District of Columbia Exchange. Our veterans deserve better.
A rebuttal from Mr. Wishon, 30 seconds. Yes, uh, what we have with the Veterans Administration, I don't see how that's any worse than uh, what we have in Obamacare. Matter of fact, uh, that looks like the future of Obamacare. Our Veterans Administration is uh, the worst run thing I've ever seen. I actually spent time there when they had the uh, open house and uh, or the town hall meeting and I had to sit there and listen to the way the the veterans complained about the coverage they were actually getting. So I don't know how Obamacare's works, but I'd like to see something better than Obamacare. And I'd be really surprised that uh, we don't have Thank something better than this you. already. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes the questions for the candidates for U.S. Congress District 1. And now each candidate will have 45 seconds to make a closing statement. Well, we last started with Mr. Bryan, and so the concluding statements will begin with Mr. Miller as we continue to move alphabetically. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as your representative in the United States Congress. We've been able to accomplish a great deal. A lot has happened uh, since I was first elected. I think the most important thing that we need to focus on in this current administration and future federal administrations is accountability uh, and transparency. The things that we don't see right now under the Obama administration. But I'm asking for your vote once again to send me back to represent the first district of Florida. And I want to thank WSRE for providing this opportunity for us to speak to our constituents through your program. Thank you. All right, and next we move to you, Mr. Wishern, for your closing statement. You have 45 seconds, sir. Constitutionally, we need to look at Miller's voting record. He's voted for indefinite detention of American citizens. He's voted for the Patriot Act, both of which have destroyed the Bill of Rights. Uh, conservatives need to look at uh, just what he's voted for in the last month with uh, siding with Pelosi and Boehner both in uh, funding Obamacare, uh, funding uh, the Syrian rebel army, as well as many other things that he's done that's completely unconstitutional. We need to stick back to the Constitution. The military, you need to look into your future because the VA is your future because eventually you will be a veteran and how they're taking care of you now is not how they're going to be taking care of you as a veteran. Everyone needs to come together at this country because divided, we're going to fall. We need to come together as people first and then start looking at the Republican and Democratic parties. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wishern. And now, Mr. Bryan, to you for your closing statement, 45 seconds. You know, back uh, in our past, uh, Congress worked together, uh, both parties. They came together uh, to hash out their differences and to pass laws. Our Congress today is broken and it needs to be fixed. Uh, my job in the military was to solve problems. That's what I did, that's what I was trained to do. And you know, do you serve a party or do you serve a nation? I've already proven the fact I serve a nation and I'll serve a nation again in the US Congress if I get elected. But you know, this district is 74% roughly military. Uh, and it needs someone in there that understands some of these issues. All right, thank you. All right, then, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, that concludes the questions for the candidates for U.S. Congress District 1 and their closing statements as well. And we want to remind you that you are watching Rally 2014 here on WSRE TV, where candidates in the upcoming November election have the opportunity to answer questions that were prepared by committees of the Pensacola Bay Area League of Women Voters and the Okaloosa County League of Women Voters. We do have several more races ahead of us this evening. We will return in just a moment, but for now, a look at those races. You're watching Rally 2014. <music> Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I'm Mary Gutierrez. Haley Richards and I serve as co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For over 20 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. 
We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and encourage informed and active participation in government. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanation of the amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as a member of the League. For more information, visit www.lwvpba.org or www.lwvocalusa.org. And please remember to be an informed voter this year. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Escambia County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on Election Day. To vote by mail, contact the Escambia County Supervisor of Elections Office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or ask in person at the Supervisor's Office on Palafox Place in downtown Pensacola. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. Early voting takes place from Monday, October 20th through Saturday, November 1st at the seven locations listed on your screen. Early voting times are 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. at the Supervisor of Elections Office and from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. at all other locations. On the day of the general election, Tuesday, November 4th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. To verify your precinct, log on to escambiavotes.com. Be sure to take a photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to Rally 2014 on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. This is the first of two nights where we will introduce you to candidates in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties. Next up is the race for Florida House District 1. Florida House District 1 covers the majority of Escambia County. There are two candidates on the ballot. The Republican incumbent Clay Ingram is traveling and was unable to be with us for Rally this evening. His opponent, Democrat Gloria Robertson Wiggins, is with us and will receive the questions. Welcome, Ms. Wiggins. Thank you. And we will begin with this question, Ms. Wiggins. Now that Florida has rejected approximately $50 billion to expand Medicaid and has moved low-income people into managed care systems, how can the state cover the medical costs for the low-income residents who are not eligible for care under the current Medicaid rules? You have 45 seconds. Well, there, there's no easy way to recover that amount of money without taxing the individuals. Those taxes and the cuts should have never been taken away from the people of Florida. That was illegally done because you left a lot of people all vulnerable. So we can't raise taxes, but that would be the only solution we need so everybody could be covered. All right, thank you. Our next question. To compete in the world market, an educated workforce is essential. To achieve this, what is your position on mandatory pre-K classes for all students rather than continuing with the current voluntary program for these children? I think it's a great idea. Kids learn at the age of one. They're crawling at two. They're trying to talk at two. They're spelling. They're doing more things now as as we're noticing. I have grandkids too, and they are doing things I never thought I would, I, I would see done. So I approve it. All right, thank you. Question number three. Many states automatically restore voting rights to felons who have repaid their debts to society. Florida requires a seven-year waiting uh, period in most felony cases before the consideration of the restoration of voting rights. Please give us your opinion of this requirement. Well, it is a step forward, but I feel as though when individuals have returned to society, except those charged with rape and murder, I don't think they should ever have their rights back. But anybody else that doesn't have a battery, they should have their rights back, especially if it was a nonviolent crime. I would support that. All right, thank you. And our next question uh, talks about the U.S. Air Force and their proposed use of the Blackwater River State Forest for expanded military training. Are you in support of this effort by the Air Force to use these publicly owned, ecologically sensitive lands for training? And please explain your position. 
Well, I haven't studied that much on, um, on that subject. I haven't gotten a chance to really look at that and concern myself with that as much as other things that are happening right now. All right, thank you. All right, a recent proposal was made to cut taxes by a billion dollars in the state of Florida. How can the state pay for infrastructure repairs, public education, and health care for low-income residents if such cuts are made? And you have 45 seconds to answer the question. Thank you. There, that's ridiculous. That can't be done. You can't help people by taking away monies that belong to the state of Florida. You take it away, then you say you're giving it back. And then you cut in social, you know, it just can't be done. All right, thank you. Um, our next question. Considering the recent accidental death in Arizona near Las Vegas, where a nine-year-old was shooting an Uzi automatic or an automatic Uzi, please comment on whether Florida's gun safety laws are adequate as it relates to children. Well, right now, you know the toys that are being sold have this orange patch that's over the, the, the nozzle of the gun, and they ask you not to take it off, remove it. So I could understand the worry an officer may have had when, when, you know, this child is pointing his gun, but I also would think, you know, he would have uh, uh, decided something a little different. But right now with the gun laws the way they are, they're doing whatever they want. All right, thank you. And your final question. In November, voters will decide whether to amend the state constitution to allow for medical, the use of medical marijuana. What is your opinion of this proposal? I'm for the use of it because many people need it. I've been around family members that has cancer. I just lost my sister to cancer. And she was given the marijuana dose in Texas. She could not get it here, but she got it in Texas. And I feel it does help, and it will cut down a lot of the uh, broken laws that are going down, too. All right, thank you. And that concludes now the questions for Florida House District 1. Again, we'd like to remind you there are two candidates in this race. The Republican candidate, incumbent Clay Ingram, was unable to attend rally as he is traveling. Ms. Robertson Wiggins, it is now time for your closing statement, and you have 45 seconds. As I sit here before you today, I thought we would talk about the common core of education. That is a real problem for me. I thought we would talk a little about the stand your ground law because that's still a topic that needs to be addressed. We have so many things that are going on in Florida. It takes time to sort everything out, but we have to be willing to tell the truth about it and work hard to protect our citizens and our children. All right, thank you. Thank you. And we will have more election coverage still to come this evening. Rally 2014, we'll be right back. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I am Ed Meadows, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into Rally 2014, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV, and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. On the November ballot, there are three amendments to the Florida Constitution. A 60% margin is required for passage. 
Here's a look at what each amendment covers. Amendment 1, Water and Land Conservation. This amendment dedicates funds to acquire and restore Florida conservation and recreation lands. The ballot summary reads as follows. Funds the Land Acquisition Trust Fund to acquire, restore, improve, and manage conservation lands, including wetlands and forest, fish and wildlife habitat, lands protecting water resources and drinking water sources, including the Everglades, and the water quality of rivers, lakes, and streams, beaches and shores, outdoor recreational lands, working farms and ranches, and historic or geologic sites by dedicating 33% of net revenues from the existing excise tax on documents for 20 years. Amendment 2, use of marijuana for certain medical conditions. The ballot summary of Amendment 2 reads as follows. Allows the medical use of marijuana for individuals with debilitating diseases as determined by a licensed Florida physician. Allows caregivers to assist patients' medical use of marijuana. The Department of Health shall require and regulate centers that produce and distribute marijuana for medical purposes and shall issue identification cards to patients and caregivers. Applies only to Florida law does not authorize violations of federal law or any non-medical use, possession, or production of marijuana. Amendment 3, prospective appointment of certain judicial vacancies. The ballot summary of Amendment 3 reads as follows. Proposing an amendment to the state constitution requiring the governor to prospectively fill vacancies in a judicial office to which election for retention applies resulting from the justices or judges reaching for mandatory retirement age or failure to qualify for a retention election and allowing prospective appointments if a justice or judge is not retained at an election. Currently, the governor may not fill an expected vacancy until the current justices or judges term expires. For more detailed nonpartisan information, you can download the Florida League Voters Guide. Log on to thefloridavoter.org, the website for the League of Women Voters of Florida. Scroll down to the 2014 Voter Guide section and click on Download. The guide will appear on your screen. When you scroll down to the amendment section, the synopsis of each amendment and an explanation of what a yes or no vote will mean will be displayed. Welcome back to Rally 2014 as we count down to Election Day, which is coming up on November 4th. Tonight, and then again Wednesday night, you will have the opportunity to hear from candidates in races in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties. We continue now with the race for Florida House District 2, which covers the southern part of Escambia County and Gulf Breeze in Santa Rosa County. There are two candidates on the ballot. The Republican incumbent Mike Hill was unable to attend Rally 2014 tonight. The Democratic candidate Jeremy Lau is in the studios with us tonight and will receive the questions, which again were provided to us by the League of Women Voters. We welcome you to Rally 2014, Mr. Lau, and we are going to begin now with question one. Now that Florida has rejected approximately $50 billion to expand Medicaid and has moved low-income people into managed care systems, how can the state cover the medical costs for low-income residents who are not eligible, eligible for care under the current Medicaid rules? You have 45 seconds to answer each of these questions, sir. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me back, uh, and it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, the first thing we can do is accept the federal money. Uh, the state of Florida, the question isn't really whether the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. The Supreme Court settled that question for us. Uh, our only real requirement is, are we going to see a return on our taxpayer investment and, and expand those programs? Uh, my wife is currently uh, at Sacred Heart Hospital, uh, pregnant with our first child, and uh, Dr. Julia Hoffman and the women's group have taken very good health care of her. And I couldn't morally deny anybody the same excellent coverage uh, that my wife is receiving as we speak. All right, thank you. Our next question. To compete in the world market, an educated workforce is essential. To achieve this, what is your position on mandatory pre-K classes for all students rather than the existing or the current voluntary program in the state? I, I think that the... the 
the VBK programs should be expanded. Uh, whether you make it mandatory or not it, it is a question for, for discussion. Um, I think the program should be available for those that choose to send their children through that program. It, it's a very good program. It has a high success rate. And, and I think that it can help improve our educational system, especially in the early years. Um, one thing I wouldn't do would be uh, cut $1.3 billion from the budget and then turn around and call it a victory for our state. Uh, it's not a victory for our state, and it's not a victory for our children either. Um, so I would expand uh, those programs uh, and make them available to as many, as many children as we can possibly put through. All right, thank you. All right, um, sir, many states automatically restore voting rights to felons who have repaid their debts to society. Florida requires a seven-year wait in most felony cases before consideration of restoring voting rights. Would you please give us your position on this requirement? Uh, I think that once somebody has served their debt to society, uh, that they should have their rights restored. I, I said this last summer on this very program that if they don't have their rights restored, every sentence becomes a life sentence. Uh, and if they've done their time and they've served their debt to society, they should at some point have their rights restored. It disenfranchises tens of thousands of citizens in this district alone who have maybe made a mistake somewhere in their past and they just seem, can't seem to get away from it under the current system. Uh, I will say that under the current governor, Fewer Floridians have had their rights restored than almost any governor in, in its past, and, and it's shameful. All right, thank you. To our next question now, Amendment 3 on the November ballot would give an outgoing governor authority an appointment of Supreme Court justices who must retire at the age of 70. Please comment on whether the outgoing governor or the incoming governor should have this authority. Uh, I, I think that that would probably be a, a matter left to the incoming governor. I, I typically don't vote for constitutional amendments. I think that there's legislative remedies uh, usually available in those situations, and this is probably one of them. Um, you know, it, you shouldn't be changing the Constitution to uh, suit every political whim. And, uh, I, and in this case, I just I don't think that we should be changing the Constitution. I, I like the way that our judges are appointed in the state as we have it. All right, thank you, sir. A recent proposal was made to cut taxes by $1 billion in our state. How can the state pay for infrastructure repairs, public education, and health care for low-income residents if such uh, cuts are made? They can't. Uh, <laughs> you, can't you can't have it both ways. You can't cut taxes and, and take care of your infrastructure. Uh, we have been running this policy of cutting taxes and cutting taxes for decades now. And our infrastructure tragically has been neglected as witnessed in April when our prison blew up. Uh, now we are stuck with a situation where we have a prison that needs to be rebuilt and we're paying to house our prisoners in other counties. Uh, you cannot continue to neglect your infrastructure at the expense of taxes. And I make pretty good wages uh, for this area and for these tax cuts that they talk about, well, I haven't seen a whole lot of them, so I'm not sure where these tax cuts are going. All right, thank you. Our next question. Considering the recent accidental death in Arizona near Las Vegas where a nine-year-old was shooting an automatic Uzi, please comment on whether Florida's gun safety laws are adequate as they relate to children. Uh, I think the current makeup of the Florida legislature doesn't, uh, doesn't really lend itself to any kind of, uh, of common sense gun discussion whatsoever. Um, so for me to sit there and say that I would go to Tallahassee and uh, spend the taxpayers' valuable time trying to get common sense gun legislation through this legislature is, is just not something I'm going to do. Uh, my focus is rebuilding our infrastructure and educating our kids and providing meaningful jobs for, uh, for our constituents. And hopefully one day we could actually have a, a real discussion on that issue, but currently in this legislature we can't. All right, thank you, sir. And yours, one final question for you this evening, and it also relates to a constitutional amendment uh, proposal. In November, voters will decide whether to amend the Constitution to allow for the medical use of marijuana. What is your position on the use of marijuana for medical purposes in the state of Florida? Uh, I, 
I, I will be supporting that constitutional measure. Uh, the, the biggest problem with it right now is the federal, the federal blocks that, that come along with medical, medical use of marijuana. Uh, if there is a remedy available to somebody who is ill and sick and doesn't require a prescription or a hospital visit, I, I think that the moral thing to do is allow our citizens to have access to that if a doctor thinks that it will help them. Uh, I'm not a doctor and, and, and neither is the Florida legislature. So I think that we should leave that situation between a doctor and a patient. And if a doctor thinks that's a suitable remedy, then they should have it available to them. All right, thank you. Again, a reminder that there are two candidates in this race. The Republican incumbent, Mike Hill, was unable to be with, with us tonight. So that means there will be just one closing statement, and that will be from you, Mr. Lau. And, sir, you have 45 seconds. Good evening. I'd like to thank the uh, WSRE and the League of Women Voters for conducting the rally again this year. Uh, and this district needs a representative that will show up. I have proven that. This election cycle, I have spoken to the Santa Rosa County Tea Party movement. I've spoken to the Santa Rosa County Young Professionals. I've spoken to groups that agree with me and disagree with me, but I've shown up. When the governor proposed putting a parole office right down the street from a park and a high school, I st stood in front of the, t the city council and told those constituents that I would take their fight to Tallahassee, and I did. And your representative was silent on the issue. This district deserves a representative who shows up, and I will be that representative. I don't need $50,000. I just need 50,000 votes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Lau. And it's time now for us to move to the next race, and this will be the race for Okaloosa County School Board District 3. There are two candidates in this nonpartisan race. And to introduce the candidates for Okaloosa County School Board District 3, uh, we will meet those candidates now, and our candidates are seated in alphabetical order. First is Joe Slusser, and the second candidate in this race is Rodney L. Walker, and he is the incumbent. We welcome both of you to Rally 2014. And a reminder that the questions in this race have been compiled by a committee of the Okaloosa County League of Women Voters. We begin our questions first uh, to you, Mr. Slusser. And our first question tonight, what recommendations would you make and how to better evaluate teachers for retention and rewards? Well, yes, uh, and thank you for having us here tonight. And uh, this is my second appearance here, uh, once during the primary. Um, I would like to tell you that teachers need to be observed and there's, there's scales that we use to uh, grade the teachers. You know, uh, they're pushing down to uh, go by the class and how the, the students perform to grade the teachers. And if you have a class of advanced kids or kids that are higher achievers, it's a whole lot different. And uh, some of the classes that uh, I have taught in the past as a 44-year teacher, some of the students I had were the, were the ones that had been retained or kids with special needs. And so I think that that qualification needs to be done uh, with the subjective matter. All right, thank you. And now to you, Mr. Walker. What recommendations would you make in how to better evaluate teachers for retention and rewards? Well, the thing is, is so much is predetermined now by the legislature on how we evaluate our teachers. And the thing we must always remember is any type of evaluation system that affects our teachers that needs to be certain that we involve our teachers. And unfortunately, in many cases, this does not happen. And let me just say that I think that we have some very good programs in place to evaluate teachers, but I do think we need to involve our teachers much more as we do evaluate them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Walker, we'll be, we will begin question number two with you. In your opinion, how could there be greater transparency about the funds and use of allotments made available to school board members to disperse to the schools in their district? Well, as uh, we, we basically say in Okaloosa County, have a what we call a $75,000 allotment to each board member that can be spent just very specifically for capital outlay projects. And what this has been very helpful in helping many of the smaller schools, rural schools, and even some of our larger schools that 
we, it's allowed us to be able to purchase certain capital projects for these individual schools. And we've found over the years that it's been very helpful and very useful. All right, thank you. And the question now to you, Mr. Slusser. How do you believe there could be greater transparency about the funds and use of allotments made available to school board members to disperse to the schools in their district? Well, that should be on a website where we could go as either teachers and educators or uh, the voters and the parents. We should be able to go in there and see where this is spent. Um, I know that they're, they're saying it's been spent uh, an allotment for different schools, but I was up at uh, one of the schools, Laurel Hill, the other day, and it's in dire need of some repairs on, uh, in the school, and uh, Baker needs repairs. And I've seen some of the other schools, but I kind of wonder where the money has been spent. So I think it needs to be a uh, public record on the Internet where we could pull it up and see where this money from each one of the board members and where it's placed and where the emphasis is placed. All right, thank you very much. Our next question will go first to Mr. Slusser. Voucher funds can now be used to send or keep pupils in religious schools. What are your views about using public funds for the education of students in these religious schools? You know, uh, voucher funds are one of the things that seems like it splits almost 50 percent of the people that I've talked to. Uh, I'm in favor of vouchers to allow people to uh, parents to put their children in schools to where they're getting a better education. In some school systems, the schools are not that uh, high grade. Okaloosa County schools are very, very good. But I, I know some parents that have pulled their children out and put them into uh, uh, religious-based schools. Uh, we got several schools like that in Okaloosa County. Uh, and it's a parent choice. And one thing about this in our country, we need to have the choice to where our kids are educated and what they are learning and with whom they're learning with. All right, thank you. And next, uh, this question goes to Mr. Walker. Um, what do you think? What are your views about using public funds for education of students in religious schools? Well, I think that the voucher program, which has been here for many, many years now, and basically, uh, I think that the way the current laws are written, I think that vouchers are a very fair program. And uh, I think that it's like so many other type of programs, such, such, such as your voucher program. And sometimes it, there is some misuse, but uh, overall, I think that I believe that our voucher program works very well. All right, thank you. And this next question goes to you first, Mr. Walker. What recommendations do you have for attaining the most effective use of school advisory councils in district schools? And you have 45 seconds, sir. Well, school advisory programs, has, since it came into existence, has worked, worked very well. And I think it's uh, the right direction to go in trying to get parental involvement back in our schools. And I think that that's one of the things that has really caused our public schools in many instances to actually do a little bit of backsliding, if we want to use that word. But I, I'm very, very proud of our program in Okaloosa County, and I think it's worked wonders really at our schools. All right, and to you now, um, Mr. Slusser, what recommendations do you have for attaining the most effective use of school advisory councils in district schools? Well, the, the most effective use of uh, the, SAC, uh, the SAC committees or student advisory councils uh, is open it up to the parents and the business to come in and, and to voice their opinions. Parents and, uh, and the public have been such a tremendous support of our schools over the centuries, and the Okaloosa has been using the SAC programs very well, but we need to open it up to the businesses and people. The PTSAs and the PTAs, the parents don't usually get to speak up, but the SAC, they actually have an active involvement. We need to strengthen the SAC committees and let them have the power that they need and that we want them to have as teachers and educators. All right, thank you. Our next question will go first to Mr. Slusser. What changes in the use of technology would you recommend to help reduce the paperwork burden on classroom teachers? Well, that's a that's a big problem that we have. Uh, as far as technology, they have a lot of they have the smart boards, and we have a lot of technology in the in most of the classrooms now, to where we we have the means for the teachers to teach online and actually directly send it to, to the kids. And um, I think that we need, uh, as far as the technology. The hard paper and the stuff that we do, 
um, the teachers had carry, carry uh, homework assignments on. I hear people talking about we need to get rid of textbooks. I'm not in favor of getting rid of textbooks. I'm still, I guess that, that's part of the old school back to basics part. I believe in having textbooks and so that the parents can see the book and see what they what their students and their children are learning. All right, this question to you, Mr. Walker. What changes in the use of technology would you recommend to help reduce the paperwork burden on classroom teachers? Well, as we all recognize, is technology is what you call there is no bottom to the bucket. There is not a, there's never enough money to buy the newest toy. But what we must remember is the Florida legislature has already passed laws that requires us starting next year that 50% of all of our textbook revenue will actually go to technology that will be electronic textbooks. And so we must understand with the change in society is we've got to change with it. And uh, in other words, half of our revenue for regular textbooks will no longer exist after this school term. Thank you. All right, so Mr. Walker, this piggybacks off of that question that you were just asked about technology and as it relates to the teachers, how do you rate the use of technology in the classrooms in Okaloosa County? Well, I think that as we all understand with the society we're now living in, that we must focus on the technology that the kids in the classroom, it will be designed and if so that all the students will be able to actually use the technology in a way that they will get a grasp and a great understanding of the basic skills. And this is very important that we must be certain after technology that they can still be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And that's very important. And you must be sure that you keep that in focus as we use technology in the classroom. And the question now to you, Mr. Slusser, how do you rate the use of technology in Okaloosa County classrooms? I think it's at the top. Uh, Okaloosa County, I, I just retired as a teacher and the technology in the classroom I had was superb. And the availability and the students, they love to use the, as, as uh, Mr. Walker was saying, the most modern toys. But they use this as an educational. Uh, I, I am a little bit concerned about the t uh, some of the tablets and things that they might be using, electronic tablets, that don't produce a finished product. I think that something they would do, it needs to be able to produce a finished product that can be turned into the teacher. I still believe that there needs to be a material that they can turn in, not something they just send out electronically to the teacher. And so, but I do think that the, the use in Okaloosa County is right at the top. All right, thank you. And we have one final question for our candidates for Okaloosa County School Board, District 3, and it will go first to Mr. Slusser. What do you consider the best way to receive and handle parent complaints about school issues? Well, first off, you need to listen. And a lot of times what we do is we hear things and we've already made our mind up how we're going to answer before the parent ever finishes their the complaint or their suggestion. I hate to call them complaints. Sometimes they're suggestions that we might see a little bit on the negative side. And as a previous administrator, I would have parents come to me and the thing I would learn to do was to listen to it and when they were through, I would know. I think we need to listen to parents and kind of understand from what they're coming from. You know, as a parent and a grandparent, I've been in those shoes before, and as a teacher and administrator, I've been on the other side. But we need to listen and really show a caring heart. All right, thank you. And now this question to Mr. Walker. What do you consider the best way to receive and to handle parent complaints? Well, the most important thing to remember is, as our school district belongs to the parents and their, and their, and their kids, and, and the most important that, let me emphasize very, very strongly that as long as we always recognize that our schools are for their kids, mm -hmm. and if we will listen to the parents and take great input from them and try to make sure that it's what's best for their kids, I think that's the most important thing we can do. All right, thank you. And that completes the question and answer session for Okaloosa County School Board District 3. And now each candidate will have 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement. Mr. Slusser began the question and answer segment, so Mr. Walker, we will begin closing statements with you, and you have 45 seconds, sir. Well, thank you, and I just want to thank the 
WSRE and I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having the second opportunity to be here tonight. And the most important thing to remember is that I'm a lifelong conservative Republican, that I intend to always have very conservative values. And the main thing that I've proven by being a chairman of the school board for several terms is that my never lose sight of one thing is my most important job is to remember one thing, is the students and what's best for them. Thank you. All right, now, closing statement for you, Mr. Slesser. Well, this is a nonpartisan race, and we need to remember that. And it's about voting for the person that has the experience, the background, and the credentials for this. I taught school for 44 years, and, um, and I was an educator uh, and uh, administrator, so I've been in, and I've taught the handicapped children, kids with disabilities, and I've caught all the way up to the advanced program. And you know, it's a, it's a, is the kids first, and, and that's what my m mantra's been since I started teaching back in 1970. We need to keep kids first, we need to keep parents and their thoughts and their concerns foremost. We need to work to change the school system to make it better. We can always make it better. And, you know, I'm new to the race, and I'm never going to be called a politician. I'm an educator. Right, thank thank you. you. All right, thank you, gentlemen. And those were the candidates for Okaloosa County School Board District 3. In case you are just joining us, I'm Drexel Gilbert. And I'm Sandra Averhart. This is night one of two nights of primary, or rather, general election coverage on WSRE. We are less than a month away from that November 4th general election. And one final race to highlight this evening, and that is the race for mayor of Pensacola. We're back with that right after this. Stay with us. Thank you for watching Rally 2014 on WSRE TV. I'm Mary Blackwell, president of the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa County. For over 20 years, the Okaloosa and Pensacola Bay Area Leagues have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. The success of our democracy depends on active participation by informed citizens, which begins with voting. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments, merit retention of judges, and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of the League. Please see our website for more information or to contact us. And please remember to be an informed voter this year. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Santa Rosa County. By mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Santa Rosa County Supervisor of Elections Office by phone, mail, fax, or email. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on election day. Early voting takes place from Monday, October 20th through Saturday, November 1st at the Santa Rosa Supervisor of Elections Office in Milton and at the South Santa Rosa Service Center on Highway 98 in Gulf Breeze. Early voting hours are each day from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. On the day of the general election, Tuesday, November 4th, voting takes place from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to take a photo and signature ID with you. Up next, our final race of this evening, and that is the race for mayor of the city of Pensacola. Now, there are two candidates on the November ballot in this race, which is a nonpartisan race, naming the candidates alphabetically. The first candidate is Donna Clark, and we welcome you to rally Ms. Clark. All right, and of course, the second candidate in this race is incumbent Ashton Hayward, but he was unable to attend rally this evening. And so uh, even though Mr. Hayward is not here, in the interest of disclosure, we want to let you know that he is a member of the WSRE Foundation Board of Directors. 
All right, now, Ms. Clark, we are ready to begin with you with question one, and you will have 45 seconds for each of your answers to these questions. Question one, please give us your opinion on whether the city charter should be amended to give the city council greater authority. Oh, absolutely. I am very much uh, for the amendments coming up. I have been attending all the meetings for a year and a half and listening and weighing in all the variances of charter. And I think for a powered mayor that he needs to be there, she needs to be there in attendance. Our charter says that it's a recall if a mayor does not attend all those meetings. And it's imperative that he is in cohesiveness with the rest of the council so that they both, so both the legislature and the executive side of our city blend together. All right, thank you. And our next question now, what concrete steps would you take to recruit and foster new and existing businesses? I am so glad to answer that question because I'm busy doing that now. Very, very busy doing that. I believe that uh, Pensacola, you know, when we talk about 10,000 jobs that have been created, I'd say, okay, uh, where have we had 10,000 jobs created in the last four years? I am looking at a company right now out of Mississippi that is getting ready to retire out about 3,000 retired individuals. It's a shipping yard. And those jobs consist of pipe fitting and welding. Those jobs start at $35 an hour. And they are looking for a place to train these folks to come in because that's a year and a half of 3,000 people leaving that position. So we will garnish, even if we garnish 1,500 of those, we'd be good. All right, thank you. Question number three, what specific actions do you believe, um, specific actions should the mayor take in the mayor's position to create a better working relationship between the mayor's office and the city council? You know, I really, <laughs> I really see it as a win-win any time that you bring in your council people for meetings, private meetings, however that, that rolls, you need that one-on-one -on -one relationship as well as a group relationship. Many times the mayor gets a lot of information from the ordinances and the resolutions that are coming to the council. He may have some information that they may not have on those particular things. So that cohesiveness of one-on-one -on -one togethership, after all, we are elected by the people and they expect us to play well together and make those ordinances go through the way they should go through. You had five seconds. Oh, sorry. All right, we'll move on now to our fourth question for this candidate for Mayor of Pensacola, Donna Clark. Uh, which of the current challenges now facing the city are you best suited to resolve and why? You know, I think the challenges as I've moved through our community the last year and a half and met with so many different people, I think it becomes the equality across the board, um, the equality of contracts that the city puts out to varied people, other businesses in the city. A lot of these business people feel that they are not being fairly uh, represented and so and small businesses need to be represented and they need some type of incentive uh, and help from the city because as you know the first three years of any business is critical so I'm looking to help with those small businesses and rolling back some taxes with them 30 percent to give them that incentive to roll forward and and so they can actually see the city helping them all right, thank you. Um, the city has created various plans for urban redevelopment. If you are elected, what are your goals in relation to these plans? You know, urban redevelopment is, is a very good plan. I think uh, people in our city want that. I think we want downtown housing. We want, I'm looking at DeVillers area is a more of a, a growing entity for a 20, late 20, 30 year old group that can go and buy those homes and renovate and just make that the artsy Soho area, if you will, of our community. We've got downtown going, Powell Fox is going through private entrepreneurs, private businessmen have got that going. Some federal money has gone in there and brought in some trees and uh, brick down the sidewalks. But the actual vibrance of downtown is from our pri private entrepreneurs and they need the credit for that. They need the credit for that. All right, now to our next question. Once the members of the Stormwater Task Force have been selected, what are your top priorities for this group to, to address? 
Well, you know, we've got a lot of issues. Uh, I went to symp to a symposium. I've gone to the ECA with a gas pipe, so I'm I'm very aware of what's happening in our city with 80 years of deterioration of concrete, you know, deteriorating right down to metal rusting out. And so where we would start is where we're the worst hit. You know, the study of water is a very complex study because water always finds another way. We can stop it here, but it's going to find another way to flow. So we have to be very creative in how we look at that water flow. And we have to look at those areas where we've been really hardest hit. Uh, there are areas in our city that's been hit five and six times where they've had total devastation. And that hits insurance, tax money, okay. and it kills right. their, in, their inability to live, All right, thank to live you. good. You have one more question, and this question is, what bidding procedures would you initiate to ensure fair competition in the awarding of contracts? That is such a great question. I think one that we're all concerned about, we're all looking at. You know, it to me, it's a bottom line anyway. You want quality work for the city, no doubt about that. And you want quality work that we're getting at a good price, a price that is fair and across the board. And so to initiate that would be basically what we do now is to get out there and say, let's get the bid, let's get the bids in, let's get the bids in at fair prices, and then study, you know, those bids and make sure the best person gets in on that and the best... Uh, Quality. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to take the lowest bid just because it's the lowest bid. That's not business either. Business is the quality also involved with that bid. All right, thank you. And a reminder that there are two candidates in the race for mayor of Pensacola. The incumbent Ashton Hayward was unable to attend rally this evening. Ms. Clark, that means that you now have 45 seconds to make a closing statement. Pensacola. The city of Pensacola. I've been here 34 years. The last 10 years I've given a great part of my heart fundraising in various areas and capacities, cancer, heart, independence for the blind. So I know what it is to raise money. Prior to that, I was in a uh, corporate world doing the million dollar uh, budgets, making every goal. My daughter has said to me and said to my friends, you know, my mom, and she's 38 years old, she says, you know, everything my mom's ever done, she's made that goal and she's always left it better. I'm going to tell you, my campaign is not based on empty promises. It is based on results. And those results I'm going forward now with. And you will be proud of Pensacola by the time I walk away. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark, candidate for mayor of Pensacola. And that is going to do it for night one of Rally 2014. Now, Rally 2014 will return, though, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And on Wednesday night, we will meet candidates for Santa Rosa County Commission Districts 2 and 4 and Santa Rosa County School Board District 3. We will also meet candidates for Escambia County Commission Districts 2 and 4 and Escambia County School Board District 3. We hope that you will join us again right here on WSRE-TV Wednesday night at 7 o'clock as we continue with Rally 2014. Our thanks this evening to the League of Women Voters for their participation in, the, the pro, in this program, to Pensacola State College, and also to the candidates tonight. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Good night.